Amen. If you would, please take your Bible and open up to Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And there seems to be a growing trend within the church that was prophesied to happen some two millennia ago. And that's a great falling away. People, rather than holding on to the sincere word of God, the sincere truth of the word of God, we would rather have our ears tickled. Uh, we would rather have feel-good messages. I touched on that a little bit this morning. Many in the church are being deceived by false doctrines, false teachings, and all delivered by false teachers. They're being taught and believing a false gospel, not the true gospel. Paul told the church at Corinth, I believe it is, that if we bring a gospel to you other than this gospel right here, let us even be accursed. Because there's only one true gospel. We've been talking about that on Sunday morning. That the message that we proclaim doesn't contain the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. And, and, and so we find that Paul prophesied to young Timothy there's going to be a following away. We find that the author of Hebrews, whoever you want to say he is, whether you say it's Paul or Barnabas or, or Luke or Aquila or some other, uh, other evangelist out there, we, when we look at this, he warns his, his readers. And we know according to Hebrews chapter 3, and I believe it is verse 1, that he is talking to fellow Christians when he says, My dear brethren, and in this message he says, Therefore we... In Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. So he's talking to fellow believers. And he warns them of a drifting away. He warns them of not holding on to the faith. Being deceived. Going after faith fable. And so we're tonight in Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 1 through 4. If you're there, say amen. amen. It says, therefore... We ought to give the most earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you this morning, or this evening rather, Lord, and we seek you and we seek your truth, Lord. Help us not drift away, Father, but help us cling to your truth and your word. Help us not slip to the side, but hold on. God, we realize the temptations are there. We, will, we realize, Lord, that this world is full of things that look very colorful on the surface, yet deep down inside it's death. Father God, we look around us and we see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. But Father God, help us stand firm on your word. Because your word declares us the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life will be destroyed. But those who trust in you, those who love not the things of the world but love you, will abide forever. We know your word will last forever. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your word stands firm. God, speak to us tonight. Don't let it be I that speak tonight, Lord, but you that speak through me. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Are you drifting? Are you drifting? In verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 2 it says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. He begins with a warning not to drift away from the gospel. He, he, he says, lest at any time we should let them slip. 
Uh, let them, these words, these assurances that we've been dealing with in the first full chapter of the book of Hebrews. Uh, that we have a firm word who, who Jesus is and He is solidified in the testimony and witness of God. That, we, that, that He is better than the prophets. That He is better than the angels. That He is a firm foundation. That we have a truer word and a truer hope than anything this world could ever afford. That, that word slip in the Greek actually means to just kind of drift, oh, drift away like on a boat out on the sea with no anchor or nothing. It just kind of drifts and, and goes its way. I wonder how many of us in the church today are doing just that. We're drifting along, we're coasting along in society. We, we've left the sure foundation of the Word of God. We left the pure foundation, the, the pure foundation and the sure foundation of the gospel that Jesus was born of a virgin, came and lived a sinless life, died for all mankind's sin. God raised him. He ascended to the Father. The gospel in a nutshell to give us victory and freedom from sin. Now, by the way, we didn't die to save us from hell. He died to save us from victory and power over sin. Going to heaven with him is a byproduct of why he died for. He died to pay the penalty to give us victory. I wonder how many of us are drifting away to some new age theology. Where Jesus isn't a way, I mean not the way, but Jesus is a way. I wonder how many of us are having the mindset that we have in a postmodernistic society is your truth and my truth are different truths, but yet they're the same truth. Brothers and sisters, you can't have two truths. It's either true or it's not true. And it doesn't matter. It is not dependent upon what society says is true. It's dependent upon what thus saith the Lord is true. Amen? It doesn't matter what daddy says. It doesn't matter what the preacher says. What matters is what God says. And we got many today that are drifting away from the faith. Drifting away from a true gospel. So we have a warning not to drift from the gospel. We also, we are not to drift because of the assurance of the message we've heard. Therefore. When you see the word therefore in your Bible, that is a stop sign for you. That is a sign that says, hold up, I need to stop. And go back and read what was beforehand. A lot of times, if you look in my Bible and in my notes, when I'm, when I'm reading and I'm studying and you see therefore, I will circle therefore and draw an arrow back to what Paul or, or, or John or one of those prophets was talking about. Because what he's about to say is in lieu of what he just said. And so we look at, therefore, reminds the readers of the epistle to look back to the preceding paragraphs. Throughout the first chapter, the author of Hebrews declares the power and assurance of Old Testament prophecy. He, he allows them to see the fulfillment of that prophecy through Jesus Christ. And then he reminds them of the definitive importance of Jesus and the factual evidence that God spoke through Jesus, his very own son. And he says, in light of all these truths, Therefore, see, sometimes we just need to take a step and go back, amen? I wonder how many of us rush through books. I am not a reader. I'm not an avid reader. I study for sermons. I, I do that kind of prep. I'm one of the crazy people that I love reading commentary and theology and, and doctrine and, 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 and textual criticisms. And I read those things and I get fascinated by it. A regular book bores me to death, to be honest with you. But then some of y'all would say, well, preacher, what you read might actually bore me. And that's okay. But when I do pick up a book that, that, that has gripped my eye and, and tickled my fancy, if I'm reading through it, there are times that I have to take a stop and go back and read the last page or two before I get started again. Just because I've done forgot something. Brothers and sisters, if you're studying the Word of God and you're reading the Word of God and you come across the word therefore and you don't remember what was before therefore, you need to go back therefore. 
Amen? And remind yourself what it was about. Remind yourself of the truth. Remind yourself why you are here. Because we are to keep from drifting by holding on to and seeking the truth of God's sure word. We are to keep from drifting by holding on to and seeking the truth of God's sure word. It says, give more earnest heed to the things we have heard. I, I, I don't know about you, but when I was in school and I took tests, I loved study guides. I could memorize a study guide. And then I would go back to that test that that study guide was on. And I'd write every one of them answers down real quick. And then I'd forget what I was taught. But I had that study guide memorized. And, and so I would forget things. Even when I was in seminary, to be honest with you, I'm just going to be honest about it. When it comes to the test, I spread red books. I, I would look at things that were quick. I mean, when you're reading anywhere in the neighborhood of 300 pages a night, it's hard to comprehend everything. Amen? I don't care who you are. Unless you're one that's got one of photographic memory, you just don't, can't maintain it all. I'd get those study guides, and I would look at them. Look, I still go back and look at notes from seminary. Sometimes I just got to remind myself. You know what? There are some people in the church today that just need to go back to the Word of God and remind themselves of what it says. If we had more believers in Christ studying the Word of God, reading the Word of God, not just speed reading, but truly taking their time and reading the Word of God, I don't think we'd have the problems in the church we have today. I believe the problems would work themselves out through the anointing of the Word of God. When's the last time you picked up the Word of God like you have your last uh, Harlequin romance or your, you, your newspaper or whatever else and you really just read it and studied it and took note about what you were reading? Not for Sunday school prep. Not for sermon prep. By the way, 99% of the time you have no excuse not to be ready for the message on Sunday morning or Sunday night. Because if I'm preaching through a book, you know where I'm fixing to go. You have no excuse not to have read that before and looked at it, got some notes. Some of y'all like, he, he, he just said that, didn't he? I did. You don't even have to have a Sunday school book. You know where it's going. Brothers and sisters, we need to pick up the word of God and desire it. Amen? We, we need to desire the sure word of God. The scripture calls us to desire the sincere miracle of the word of God. In 1 Peter 2 and 2 it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. You know why we got problems in the church today? Is we got a bunch of infants. They don't know the word. They have the idea of the word. But they're choking when it comes to the meat because they never got off the milk. Brothers and sisters, we've got to start somewhere. And we should have a desire to indulge on the Word of God. We should feast off of it. The Word of God should be a spiritual buffet to us. Where we just sit there and feed off of it and feed off of it and feed off of it. it it's not about what our friends say. It, it's not about what society says is cool or not cool. It's about what God says. So not only do I ask, are you drifting? But then we have to understand the message of great importance. Because what we're losing and what we're drifting away from is the message of utmost importance. In verses 2 and 3 it says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? The message of angels was firm. 
In chapter 1, he was talking about those messages of angels. If the word spoken by angels was steadfast, the, the message that brought forth by the angels was the law. The law was not bad. The law was good. It was not sufficient for man's salvation. For if it was, there would be no reason for God to send His Son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. But it was good. The Old Testament is not something to run from or hide from or, or get away from. It's something that we can glean from and, and hold on to and learn from. In Galatians in chapter 3 and verse 19, as Paul was writing to the churches of Galatia, he says, Wherefore then, wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression until the seed, talking about Jesus Christ, should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, i.e. the prophets. He was saying what we had in the Old Testament and the law, the angels brought. But it was to testify about Jesus to come. And the mediator where the prophets were delivering it. How many of us are holding on to the truth of the word of God? It was the law that we find the promised judgment of sin whether you live by the law or not. Every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense or reward. If you did this, you got this. I, I tell my, I tell the, the, the kids all the time that if you, if you do something, you should be able to expect and accept the repercussions of that. That there is always a response. There is always something that happens because of our actions. And my former youth pastor at Friendship would say this all the time. If you do the crime, be willing to do the time. And in the law, that's just what it is. You earn what you get. But in the grace of Jesus Christ, there's things that come out called mercy and grace. And you don't always get what you deserve. Because the reality of it is every one of us deserve hell. And we see that in the law. But through the gospel, we see the righteousness and care of God. We need to realize that the law was our schoolmaster and showed us our need for salvation in Galatians 3 and 24. It says, wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by the faith. So not only do we see that the message of the angels was firm, but we find the message of Jesus is greater. So great a salvation. So great a salvation. Outside of the hope of the gospel, there's no escape for damnation. How shall we escape if we neglect? That, that word neglect, to understand it in the, he, in the Greek means to be careless of, to make light of. My mother and father loved me. They loved me unconditionally. But I knew not to take their love for granted. I understood that despite their love for me, and despite the unconditional love for me, at some point they would judge. At some point, they would discipline. And just because my mother and father loved me dis did not mean that, that they weren't going to discipline. And it didn't give me the right or the privilege to take advantage of that love. In the same way, God loves us. He does love His children. But as Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 6, 1 and 2, it says... Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What does it say, church? God forbid. How for those are dead to sin live any longer therein? And just as we shouldn't neglect and take for granted our parental love, we should never take for granted the love of God. And many in the church today are doing just that. I can keep doing this because God will forgive me. I can keep doing this because God will forgive me. 
Do you know what the key to forgiveness is? It's a word, repentance. There is no forgiveness without first repentance. And just as my mother and father would not forgive me if I kept doing the same thing over and over again, I believe God calls us to the same repentance. He's calling us to no longer neglect his love. There is hope in Jesus. There is peace in Jesus. There is salvation in Jesus and Jesus alone. Let us not neglect that. Let us not take that for granted. Let us not try to seek after something else. But let us desire Jesus. And Jesus before all. Not only... Is the message of Jesus greater, so great a salvation? The, the message of Jesus is verifiable. The G- message of Jesus was verifiable through Jesus' very own testimony. First began to be spoken by the Lord. The message of Jesus was verifiable through the disciples and those that were there when it said, Confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Do we not realize that literally the last book of the Bible was written within 62 years of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. The book of Revelation was wrote in 95 A.D. Most of the books that Paul wrote were written by the mid-50s, within 20 years of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews comes between the mid-50s and the early 60s, if my timeline is correct. So we're looking at less than 30 years of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, this book being written. People can testify to this truth. There's people that are atheists that testify to the truth of the Word of God. That they can't deny it. Now the atheists today will deny it. But the first century atheist that was there would say, I can't explain it. I don't believe it, but I can't deny it because I saw it happen. We need to realize we have a sure truth before us. It is verifiable. So not only do we see the question, are you drifting, and a message of great importance, but we also see God testify to the greatness of Jesus' message. God testified to that. In verse 4, God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. The gospel message in its entirety was powerful enough to believe. What Jesus did was powerful enough. But God has put his stamp of approval on its authenticity And did so through various ways. God revealed the authenticity of the gospel. God also bearing them witness. God bears witness through visual means. Through signs, wonders, and diverse miracles. We find the early church was inundated by various signs. In Acts 2 and 43 it says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. In Acts 6 and 8, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. These signs and wonders and diverse miracles all had a purpose and still have a purpose. In fact, they have a twofold purpose. The first purpose is to lead people to faith in Christ. That's what their purpose was for. In John chapter 2 and verse 11 it says... This beginning of miracles did Jesus in the cane of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed on him. There are times, brothers and sisters, that for you to really believe Jesus, he has to do something for you. For there are times for us to really believe Jesus that we've got to see him do something in somebody else's life for us to really get it. And in that, you need to realize he's doing that to manifest his glory, not yours. He's leading people to him, not you. And then we also find in John chapter 20 and verse 31, 
But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have eternal life through Jesus or through His name. Brothers and sisters, the things that Jesus did had a purpose. These wonders and signs that we find in the transitional book of the book of Acts that transition us from the death, burial, and resurrection and earthly ministry of Jesus Christ to the ministry of the church and the, and the, and the missions of, of Paul and the prophet of John and, and all these different things. That book of transition was there to remind us just how faithful and prophetic God's words were and to show that they were coming to fruition. So the second purpose, the first purpose being to lead people to faith in Christ, the second purpose is to bring glory and honor to God. There's nothing that happens in your life that not to bring honor and glory to God. It's not for our honor and our glory, it's for His. As testified by Peter during his sermon on the day of Pentecost, if you remember, they, they began to speak in tongues and the Spirit of God came down upon them and Ben began to maybe can say that they were drunk and this, that, and the other, and Peter stands up with the others. And he says, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, You men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prosify. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dreams. And your servants and all my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Everything is to point people to Jesus and bring honor and glory to God. So I conclude with this. There is that growing trend within the church that was prophesied to happen some two millennia ago. A falling away, many in the church are being deceived by false doctrines, false teachings, and all deceived, or delivered rather, by false teachers. They are being taught and believe in a false gospel, not the true gospel. They would rather have their ears tickled than their heart pricked. Paul warns about this in the letter to young Timothy. The author of Hebrews warns to the original recipients of this issue that it seems to be a cancer among them, a drifting away from the true gospel to a false gospel. Uh, let this not be our testimony. And Jesus, in Jesus alone, one finds true gospel. The gospel that saves, sanctifies, and justifies. The gospel that brings victory from defeat and life from death. As Paul stated, if I or an angel from heaven preach to you another gospel, let us be accursed. For there is but one gospel. The gospel is simple and yet profound. Jesus was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life was crucified on the cross for sins of men, for He was perfect, was buried on the third day, and rose, or buried and on the third day, rose from the grave, and after being seen by many witnesses, including the disciples and Mary and Martha, and 500 men, of women and rena men and women of renown, ascended to the Father at the right hand this very moment, making intercession for you and I. This is the gospel in a nutshell. Do you believe? Have you ever accepted do not leave here tonight without knowing for certain you know Jesus as Lord and Savior. For there's no other way to heaven. He is the door, the lock, and the key. He is not a way, but the way. Everybody stand, please. Every head bowed and every eye 